Psalm 119, please. Psalm 119. This is considered to be the longest chapter in the Bible. It is interesting when I read the longest chapter in the Bible, there is a common theme here, a common theme. The psalmist, he describes about becoming alive, becoming alive. When we think about the word quicken in our Bible, we would often think Ephesians 2, and you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. But believe it or not, the word quicken has been more commonly used in Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. The psalmist begs to keep him alive, to make him alive. Because, as many of us today are going through, he feels like dying. He feels like life can drain him and that he needs life from the one who truly gives life. Let's look at Psalm 119, verse 25. My soul, verse 25, my soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. Look at verse 37. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. And quicken thou me in thy way. Look at verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Look at verse 88. Verse 88. The Bible reads here Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Look at verse 93. 93. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. Look at verse 107, 107. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Look at 156, 156. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgments. Look at verse 159, 159. Consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. Now, that's a lot of mention about the word quicken. Make me alive. The psalmist, he begs the Lord, he pleads the Lord to make him alive because that's how desperate he is. He's so desperate because if you read the entire chapter, he's uh, surrounded by persecutors, the world is giving him turmoil, temptation, flesh, and the sin. And he's trying to keep his eyes on Jesus Christ, trying to keep his eyes on serving the Lord the right way. Bombarded by this wicked world, we can feel like the psalmist dying. We feel like dying. And we want to be made alive. I don't know how many of you here feel like that. I could use a little bit of that. It's as if uh, before I come to church, I just want to be made alive because I've been drained by the wickedness of this world, by the harshness, by the hardships in life. I feel like dying almost every day. Perhaps some of you feel like that as well. And you want God to make you alive. Well, I believe Psalm 119 gives you about seven steps, seven ways to make yourself alive. And hopefully you can see these seven things that can help you in your life and can encourage you. So the title of my message is Psalm 119, Dead or Alive. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we do not want to be dead Christians. We want to be living alive in you, living Christians. I pray that you'll make this sermon life to those who hear. I pray that you'll raise up the dead today. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we will feel more alive than ever before. And even though we don't experience a rapture yet, we can experience some bit of a rapture now, some life, some awakening. Will you rapture us? Will you awaken us? I pray that you'll fill within me Holy Spirit power and unction from on high, for I am nothing without you, Lord. Lord, wash away our sins with your blood. Give us ears to hear. I leave the rest in your almighty hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, look at verse 25. My first point is live by squeezing. Live by squeezing. If you look at verse 25, you can see right here the psalmist is describing himself as he's squeezing. 
everything onto dear life. He's clinging on to dusk, uh, dust. The verse 25 says, My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. How many of you feel like that? You feel like you're dying. You're clinging on to dust. And you're squeezing, you're holding on to dear life. It's as if that church is great and then you wake up in the morning and all of a sudden the devil starts draining you again. And then you're surrounded by the workplace and it's as if you've forgotten about the Lord and your Christianity all of a sudden. And the world just kills you. Surrounded by the hustle and bustle of the city, the traffic that just annoys you, the sloppiness of drivers and the roads, and the sloppiness and the turmoil, not just the workplace, not outside of the home, but back in the home. And when you're back in the home, the flesh is there with you, the world surrounds you, and the devil is whispering in your ear. Some of you are probably going through some kind of hardship that we don't know about. Something bad happened to your family. Something bad is happening in your relationship. Something bad is happening in your walk with Jesus Christ. Something bad is happening personally to yourself that nobody knows and you haven't told anybody and it's in your mind and you wish that you can tell somebody you can get help from somebody but it's all kept down deep down inside the heart it's like you're clinging on to dear life you're cleaving to the dust as if you're about to scatter away get gone with the wind you're holding on to everything but just cleaving on to dust right that's how you feel like some of you don't feel intact do you some of you don't feel intact. Some of you feel like, man, it's as if I'm cleaving onto dust. I'm about to scatter. I'm falling apart. That's the only thing that's screaming out inside your mind and heart. Some of you have been coming to services and living for God for weeks, months, and years. And yet still during those weeks, it's as if when you drag yourself to church, right? You're dragging yourself to Bible reading and prayer. Dragging yourself to serve God. There's no life in you. Yeah. It's like you're dragging yourself. Right. You're falling apart. That's what you feel like. Yeah. But you know, the psalmist here, he didn't say that he's scattering away with the dust. He's not saying that he's falling apart here. You know that? No, it's the opposite. The psalmist said right here, when you look at verse 25 again, he's not falling apart. My soul not scattered with the dust, but what? Cleaveth unto the dust. Cleaveth unto the dust. What does cleave mean? Cleave means to squeeze, to grab a firm hold of, holding on to the dust see it means you are intact it doesn't mean that you're falling apart it means that you are intact you feel like that you're not intact but you actually are you know because he said i am clinging on to dust in our minds we're thinking that oh man i'm falling apart and this is it and I'm going to fall all over and I'm going to be just scattered away. Be blown away by the wind. But no, my friend, that's not what cleaving on to dust means. When you're saying, man, I'm cleaving on to dust, that means I'm holding on to everything that I've got for dear life. I'm holding on. You know what the psalmist said? When you're holding on, when you cleave to the dust, verse 25, the latter part did not say you're dying it says, quicken thou me. Verse 25 says, quicken thou me. You know what that verse is saying? You are still made alive when you're holding on. See, when you're thinking that, oh man, as I'm holding on, I'm dying, I'm falling apart. No, no, no. If you're holding on, that means you're still clinging on to life. You're holding on to life. My friend, you're still alive. As the flesh, the outward man is falling apart and, and you feel like you're dying and you're feeling like you're scattered all over and the pieces are everywhere and then you're just picking up the pieces and then it's falling apart again. My friend, nay, the Bible is saying when you're holding on, you're still alive. You're not dying. I'm dying, pastor. I'm dying as I'm holding on. No, you're not dying. You're living. You're living. You're living. 
I mean, if you hold on to life, what does that mean? You're holding, you're stuck, you're grabbing onto life. Sometimes all you can do to keep yourself alive, my friend, where you think that the singing the hymns and dragging yourself to church and serving God and all that kind of stuff could make you alive and it's not really helping you, sometimes that's just it. It's just holding on. That's it. You're still alive. I want to tell you that as you drag yourself to church, that's what you're doing. You're making yourself alive. When you're dragging yourself to Bible reading and prayer, you know what you're doing? You're making yourself alive. When you drag yourself into soul winning and your heart is not there, when you're witnessing to the soul, you know what's going on? You're dragging yourself over there. You're holding on to life. When you're preaching from the Word of God and you feel like a hypocrite for preaching, where you feel like, I'm dying, I'm going through a hard time, my heart's not in it, my mind's not in it, peace is not filling my heart, I'm just trying to give them something from the Word of God, life from the word of God when I don't have life in me my friend if you're holding on to everything that you got and you're preaching from the word of God you still got life in you Amen. Amen, you're still alive if you're holding on that's what you got to do you got to just drag 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 yourself cling on to every piece out there and keep it all in, trying to keep your mind intact when everything around you is falling apart. Trying to keep yourself as one, not breaking down. All you can do to prevent yourself from breaking down, and you said, I cannot break down, I got to keep myself together. That's what you're doing. All you can do is just that, and you will stay alive. Sometimes you're thinking about something big, something deeper, something more. No, it's just a basic thing that nearly every single individual is going through. Just hold on. Just keep on going. That's it. Just drag yourself. Just hold on. Just hold on. Just keep holding on. Nothing more than that. The second point is live by seeing, live by seeing. Notice in verse 37, verse 37, the Bible says, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. You know, uh, the psalmist says that I need to see the right things. That way I can be made alive. I cannot see vanity. I can understand when people... They try to make themselves alive, but it's so hard to just open the Bible and read. It's just so hard to get on your knees and pray. It's just so hard to just drag yourself into church when you're busy with so many other things. Work just keeps building up. I mean, driving can be hard. The distance is there. Something just interrupted your plans. I mean, schedule always changes. Something just came up at work, and that's why you can't come to church. Something just came up in the home, and you didn't plan it, you didn't expect it, but it just came out, and it's not like you deliberately skipped out on church. It just happened. Some of you feel like that, right? Some of you feel like that, you know, it's not like, hey, I just deliberately, and I chose, I am not coming to church today. No, it just happened. It just happened where you missed out one service and then turned out to be couple. And then you're coming once every few other Sundays, every few Sundays, and it turns out every few months. It just so happened. It's not something you deliberately plan or decide. It just happened. Why? There's always good reasons. That's why. Always good reasons. Pain, stress, suffering, Busyness, just things, just reasons. There are good reasons. I understand that there are good reasons people can't come to church, can't read the Bible, can't pray. I know that there's no excuse with the Lord, but when you put yourself in that person's shoes, go through their life, what they're living through, their pain that they're going through, then you, get, you start to understand more. You soften your heart a bit more and you go, man, it is just hard to serve God. 
I can understand why they skip their spiritual duty. Why? There's a good reason. You need the vacation time. You need just time out for yourself. You just need a break, right? I just need my me moment. It's all I can do to keep myself from falling apart. I'm tired enough as it is. It's a long drive. It's a long day. It takes a lot of effort on my part. I just want to take that Sunday off, that Wednesday off. Just a little bit of that. I understand. We got good reasons. But you know what the psalmist said? Well, Ecclesiastes, have you ever read that book before? It's very interesting. Ecclesiastes said that all those things that we have, family, friends, things that we go through in life, busyness, labor, everything we work for, everything, things that just happen, right? Things that just happen to happen. And you're caught up with those things, so that's what deviates you from serving God. That's what caused you to skip. You know what Ecclesiastes says? Vanity, vanity. All is vanity. Amen. Oh, by the way, didn't you read Ecclesiastes where it said, I have a good reason, Pastor. I have a good reason. Yeah, I have my good reasons too. We have very good reasons that anyone would understand why you would skip that spiritual thing for the Lord. But you know what Ecclesiastes says? Reason is also vanity. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Because at the end, what do your reasons amount to at the end? They turn to dust. They're nothing. I mean, when you live up in heaven for a million years after the judgment seat of Christ with all those rewards, what good were those reasons? Right. Nothing. They're going to mean nothing to you in heaven. They're going to mean absolutely nothing at the judgment seat of Christ. Reasons mean a lot to you now, sure. But at the end, you know, they're nothing. God's going to burn up this whole world. What good was everything that happened to happen? The good reason that caused you to skip your spiritual duty. What good were those things if God just goes, just one time go, burn world and <laughs> exploded, gone. Just like that, man, it's gone. You know what that is? That's not lasting. That's vain. That's petty. That's vanity. No matter how great your reason is, as the word of God said, it's all vanity at the end. It's vain. So when you look at Psalm 119, what did the psalmist say? He said at verse 37, turn away mine eyes from beholding what? Vanity and quicken thou me. You want to be made alive? Your eyes got to stop looking at vanity. What's vanity? Work, family, friends, your relationships, your convenient time. Very, very good reasons. That's vanity. You know what the psalmist said? Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity. You might say, why is that? Because that's all you're seeing every day, isn't it? See? Work, family, friends, relationship, uh, labor, suffering, you know, things to do in this world, possessions, security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all you're seeing every day, and those have become the reason for you to skip your spiritual duty for God. I'm not saying that you're sinning or you got a bad reason. I said good reason, reason reason. And you know what the psalmist said? Vanity! He said, that's vain! That's nothing. If you keep looking at that, you know what you're going to see it as? Not vain, as real. As genuine. And it becomes a genuine excuse for you to skip serving God on that particular thing he wants you to do. As a genuine, something genuine. But God said, no, that's not a genuine reason. That's not a genuine thing. But it's so real. Yeah, it's real to you because you kept looking at that. Keep looking at a false item for a long time, then you'll believe it's real. But if you shut your eyes away from that false thing and then set your eyes on the real thing, the real thing on Jesus Christ, 
You wouldn't skip your spiritual duties. Where have you been setting your eyes all this time? The only time you set your eyes on Jesus Christ is right now in the preaching. Your eyes are looking and beholding and understanding the word of God, what he's telling you. And that's why you get right with God. But get out of church and then all of a sudden your eyes back to the world. Back to things that become genuine and real to you. Vain things that will burn up just like that by just one simple word of God. Those vain things, they become genuine, real to you. Because that's all you're looking at. As the psalmist says, turn away my eyes from beholding. And set your eyes on Jesus Christ. And as that hymn goes, the things of this earth will go, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Uh, let's look at the third point. Live by scripture. Live by scripture. No wonder you're dying. You see that? Do you see why you're dying? Your eyes are set on vain things. You know why you're dying? It's because you're not realizing just holding on keeps you breathing, keeps you going. But the third point is live by scripture. It's so obvious. The scriptures is what keeps you alive. In verse 50, it says, This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Look at verse 107. It says, I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. You ever ate only one meal throughout the entire day? Especially throughout that entire day, you worked really, really hard or you studied very hard, or it's just been a very bad day. You're in a different area, different place, bad environment. You ever just ate one meal before? How did you feel? You feel like dying. You want to eat more. It cries out. You cry out for, I need more food. That's what keeps you living, not dying. Well then, uh, my friend, don't you know the word of God is your food, the Bible says? It is your food. Amen. It is your nourishment. How can one go through an entire day of stress, pain, hardship, working, turmoil, labor by eating one meal? Isn't the spirit inside you crying out, I need to eat more. I'm dying. So one meal don't cut it. Did you hear what I said? One meal don't cut it then. So what do you need to do? You need to read the word of God. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says that. You need to read. How often do you read the Bible? Once every couple days. You're dying. And it's crying out and you're fading away. No wonder. You read it every day and it feeds you. It keeps you going. Memorizing. You need to get the word of God in you. Through memory. Psalm 119 verse 11 says that. Why? Because just reading it, good, but then you're out in the world. You need to keep something in you all the time. So if you can't read the Bible, you need to have the word of God in your heart. So you need to memorize. But then the bulletin comes out every Sunday and here you are, you're 20 verses behind. You haven't memorized one verse yet. You're dying. Well, I memorized one verse. <laughs> memorized one verse? How good is that one verse throughout the past months of turmoil and affliction? You're dying. You're dying. But imagine if you had all the Bible like inside your heart, huh? How would you feel? You can go out, conquer the world, you'll feel like. Not enough scripture. You need more. You need more. You need the word of God in you. That's why you need to study right doctrine. A lot of people just say, what's the big deal about doctrine? Oh, you know more Bible than I do. So what? And why is this doctrine a big deal? Why are there different denominations? Hey, you need the word of God in you. And 2 Timothy 2.15 says, with the word of God, you need to study. Yep. See, you do need to know. People don't make a big deal about, well, you, just because you know more Bible than I do, you don't have as much heart for Jesus like I do. Yeah a pompous person if you have a lot of heart for Jesus you also have a lot of knowledge of his word you need to know doctrine 
To tolerate wrong doctrine shows how much you value the Word of God in you. Right. You don't. You value more your feelings, your own version of Christianity. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, right. that's why you need to study the Word of God. How much doctrine do you know? How much doctrine do you know? That's why we give in our church uh, membership package, if you're, if you're interested, if some of you don't know, we give a sheet of our statement of faith. It helps to start out knowing the right doctrines we believe in. That, you need to have that in you. If you don't have right doctrine in you, that's why you're dying. You're dying. You know why people are dying when they go to deliverance healing ministries and they still feel like they're dying? They still feel like they're suffering demonic oppression or demonic possession? It's because that's wrong doctrine, deliverance healing ministries. If they had right doctrine that that is not of the word of God, that's a different dispensation, would have saved them a lot of trouble from dying. That's why discipleship's important. Oh, it's uh, for them, but not for me. It's a wonderful thing to learn, to be trained in the Word of God and how to study more, but that's for them, huh? Not for you. See, how can you survive? How's your food going, huh? How's your eating going? No, discipleship's important. You need to grow in the Word of God. You need that Word of God in you because 2 Timothy 2.15 demands you need to study. And God forbid that some of you still don't know much. And you need pastor here to be able to study for you and teach you. Because he'll tell you everything so you don't need to study. You know, you need the word of God in you through preaching and teaching. Titus 1.3 and 2 Timothy 4.2 says the word of God can go in you through preaching and teaching. Well, I attended Sunday main service. Praise the Lord. I got the word of God in me. No, that's oh, one meal. One meal again. What happened to Sunday morning? What happened to Wednesday night? What happened to any other services? My friend, one is not going to cut it and your stomach's growling like crazy and you're dying. No wonder you're dying. Well, I came into uh, the church service, even though I came in halfway and I'm late, at least I came in and then ate some food. Some food? If you're starving to death, be happy if a person gives you half a plate. You'll live, huh? Or do you feel like dying? You feel like dying. Some of you have the spirit in you that's crying out for food, and that's why no wonder you feel like dying. Why? You're not making yourself alive with food. The Word of God in you. The Word of God should not just go in you. It should even come out of you. You might say, really? Yeah, because James 1.22 says, Be doers of the Word, not just hearers only, deceiving your own selves. See, you can't just hear and have the Word of God in you. You need to get it out. Otherwise, you're living a lie. Wow, so I can memorize all the scripture that I want, know all the right doctrines, and then attend the preaching and teaching, and I still can starve to death? Absolutely. Because God says you're living a lie if all you're getting is the word of God in you, but it doesn't come out of you. Well, how can I get the word of God out of me? That's why you need to witness. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 13, to get the word of God out, you need to tell others about the word. You need to tell them how to get saved. Show them the right doctrine. Well, that's good for them, not for me. Again, you're starving. So that food is for them, right? Not for you. And you're dying of starvation. Let's see a hungry man, when you try to give him a plate, and he's dying, then he goes, oh, no, uh, that's for them, not for me. You're dying. You're starving yourself to death. You know how you get the word, get, word of God out? Through fellowship. Fellowship. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 points out that how we were able to manifest, show the word, is because of our fellowship. When we manifest and show the word out of our lives, the result is automatically fellowship. How can a person who has the word of God in him and another brother who has the word of God in him always want to distance themselves? How can you do that? No, if you both have the word of God in you, you just want to get it out so it clings, it yearns for that bond. And didn't you hear that in the prayers today? Like-minded, like-minded. Thank you, Lord, to be in a like-minded church. 
See, what's, what that is, is you're getting the word of God out and it's making you alive. But no, some of you are like, well, I heard the preaching of the word of God and then pew, get out of there. What, uh, we don't have lunch to feed your carnality. We have lunch because that's your chance to get the word of God out. Why? You're starving. You're dying. It needs communication. It needs fellowship. Even a sat an weird day like a Saturday once a month when we have those fellowships or a summer camp or when we go out together, why do you think pastor would even plan a trip uh, out of state? Why would he even do something like that unless it's important? Oh, it's for them, not for me. Again, you're starving. You're starving. Every and any fellowship counts. You're, why? It's keeping you alive. It's keeping you alive. Now, if uh, some of you can be skeptical of me, that's fine. Then all you have to do is just do the opposite of everything I just told you. And let's see if you're made alive after that. It's okay to doubt me. It's okay to say, well, it's for them, not for me. You must be doing a fine job now then. You must not be dying at all. My fourth point is live by statutes. Live by statutes. In Psalm 119, look at verse 93. 93. The Bible says, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. You know what the psalmist said? Precepts, th those are rules, statutes. Statutes or rules is what keeps him alive. <laughs> I beg to differ. Majority of people, and a lot of liberals can agree with this, if they went to a Christian or a church environment before, Nothing will make you deader, more repressed than a machinery of rules. Come on now, let's just be honest, all right? Let's just be honest. Like, the don'ts of Christianity, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, because that's a sin, that's wrong. And you're like, man. And then you got to make sure you do this in your Christianity, do this, and you're like, oh, but that's, that doesn't appeal my flesh. Let's be honest, it, it just feels like killing us and that's why you ever wondered why according to the research bureau that majority of people who go to church all of a sudden they drop out and end up really apostate and wicked ever wondered why because nothing will make will kill you faster than a machinery of rules so then why did the psalmist said it's those rules that keep me living why would he say something like that you know why? Well, I'd like to ask you this. Did you ever have your rule? Forget the Bible, okay? Forget Christianity. Forget my rule to you, your parents, what they tell you what good rules are. Your own rule. Do you have your own rule? Your own rule that's personal to you, that you feel emotionally strong about. Did you ever have one before? You have one? I'll give you one of mine. Ooh, pastor, what is his personal rule? That's not biblical. What it is? Well, my, uh, my own personal rule is that if someone hurts an innocent life, abuse their position to hurt an innocent life, that gets me extremely angry. Part of the reason why I get upset at false pastors, see. Or pastors who... Uh, were, who acted like dictators to their members. Or business executives. Uh, one thing I really hate are bullies. I just hate that. There's something in me when you hurt somebody's life who's innocent and you take advantage of that. To me, that's like so petty. That's so petty. It just shows how weak you are, not how strong you are. So that really gets to me. That is one rule that's so personal and emotional to me. Maybe that's why God put me as a pastor. Because, man, I hate that. Nothing gets me more upset than that. I hate pride more than ever. Uh, pastors who are very prideful, it really gets to me. It all relates together. That's my own personal rule. Now, that rule is not a dead machine to me. You notice that? That rule I have is my own. It's so real 
to me. It has so much meaning to me that I take it as part of my real life. Did you notice that? You know why uh, you feel like your Christianity is a machine, a dead machine of rules that's killing you? Simple, because you don't have them that are personal and real to you. It's not your rules. Yes, it's God's rule. It's the word of God. But God's word should align with your heart. And if your heart and God's heart unite as one, then it becomes so real and personal to you. And that's why you're going to have a conviction of not skipping church if you have a rule in your mind, I can never skip church. If that's so real to you, that's so personally and emotionally strong to you, you're not going to die out. It's not going to be a struggle to live by that rule. No, it'll be easy for you to live by that rule. I cannot skip! See, it's got to be real to you, emotionally strong to you, your own rule, not pastor's rule, not pastor's rule. Can I repeat that again? You better not make this pastor's rule after this preaching. It's got to be something that's, no, that's mine. I accept that as my own rule. I make it personal to me. When you do that, it doesn't become a dead machine. It becomes real life. And those precepts make you alive more than ever before. Nothing will kill Christianity quicker than dead tradition, dead orthodoxy. Just doing it just because other people do it. That will kill you faster than anything in your Christian walk. That's why the psalmist said, if you look at verse 56, did you pay attention to that? When he lives by the precepts, these precepts are personal. Verse 56, this I had because I kept thy precepts. See that? Personal to him. Look at verse 69, 69. The Bible says, the proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. See, these are rules that are emotionally strong to him, that are personal to him. I'd like to ask you this. Uh, how many rules you got that are personal and real to you that can keep your Christian life living, huh? You got none, do you? You got none. Fifth point, live by severity. Live by severity. All right. Oh, here's a fun verse. Makes you want to shout. 156. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy... Ouch. Judgments. <laughs> Doesn't make you feel like shouting. But when God is severe with his judgment on us, it does save our lives many times. Uh, but let's get into the side of the flesh again, all right? Let's empathize with the people. Let's be realistic. We don't want that. It doesn't make us feel alive. It makes us feel bad. It makes us feel worse makes us go through a guilt trip and a cycle and then sometimes leads us further down into despondency. It doesn't keep you alive. We would prefer man's ways instead, right? Rather than God's ways. That's our flesh. Even if God judges us, severely tries to get us back into his way, uh, I prefer my way than God's judgment. Let's be honest, the flesh inside your heart, don't pretend it's only the pastor here, otherwise you're going to make me look bad, okay? Online in front of the whole world, okay? Let's be honest here, we prefer man's ways. I want to do my way rather than God's judgment. If you had a choice, your way or God's judgment, what would you choose? <laughs> man's ways, all right? Man's ways, all right? If I'm going to be honest. But uh, look at 2 Samuel 24. This is eye-opening. 2 Samuel 24. Now keep your hand here. Keep your hand at Psalm 119. Go to 2 Samuel 24. Now, if David is the psalmist of this chapter, 
then it would be understandable what David considered about God's judgment. Look at this. This is eye-opening. So David sinned against God because he did his way. And then this is what God offers to David. He gives him a choice. 2 Samuel 24, 13. 24, 13. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land, or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what, I answer, see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. Verse 14, eye opening. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. Verse 15. All right, so this is God's judgment. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. <laughs> you know what David said? David said that God's judgment, where he killed 70,000 people, I choose that one rather than falling into the hand of man. Why? Why, why would David be so stupid to say that? Because he says God's hand is more merciful. If you read the next verses, you know what God did? Yeah, he was merciful. The later verses says he repented of the evil and he stopped. But man's ways know no limits. It's endless. It will kill you. And even if you're crying and wailing in tears because you're reaping what you've sown, you're tasting the price of your sin, man's ways don't care. It'll just be merciless to you and keep killing you more. But God's judgment is more merciful. Listen, God's judgment on your life is more merciful than falling into man's hand. Falling into your own flesh. You know that? You know what you're doing right now? As you're rejecting God's judgment and doing your own way? You know what you're doing right now? You're showing no mercy to yourself. You are being merciless to yourself. You could care less what would happen to your life. And you could care less about what would happen to your loved ones affected by your wrong decision. You're merciless. You're merciless. But God's judgment has more mercy than your way. So what would keep me alive is I fall into God's judgment, not my hand. That's what will keep you alive. My sixth point is live by sympathy. Live by sympathy. Look at Psalm 119 again. Psalm 119, verse 88. Verse 88. Notice how God's sympathy is so great on your life. Verse 88 says, Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. <laughs> I know what will keep me alive is his loving kindness. You know, our problem is we always think about God's judgment. God's judgment will make me alive. God's judgment and the hardness of the Christian life. And that's what keeps killing you. That's what keeps discouraging you. My friend, it's true, but that's not what all the Christian life is about. You forgot his loving kindness. When you think about his loving kindness, then you feel alive. Then you feel alive. My friend, have you ever thought about the loving kindness of God? You are so blind to his sympathy and loving kindness that could have kept you alive. He sent you brethren who have always followed up, who have always supported, who have always prayed, who just want a fellowship, who just want to be with you, there to carry your burdens, there to carry your suffering. Pastors there during counseling. Brother and sister in Christ are there during prayer meeting. I mean, the Lord has given you loving kindness from the brethren to keep you living after a tragedy, after a hardship, after a tax from the wicked one. But then to turn that down, to turn that down, then you're dying, aren't you? How much blessings has God given to you in your life? When God has taken away some things in our lives, it hurts. 
It really does. But we forget that the Lord doesn't just take away, he gives. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. How much more has he given to you? And if you were to look at those things, you would keep yourself living. But no, you only focus on that loss of a blessing, not the increase of the blessing he's given to you. No wonder you feel like dying. I mean, physical things even, not just spiritual, social things, mental things, but even physical things he's blessed your life with. He's been so kind to you. That should keep you living. No matter how bad your life is, God's still working in you. He gave you a promise. All things work together for good, even the bad that you made. Doesn't that keep you alive because of his loving kindness? Loving kindness, even the mistakes and the bad things you've done, that he's so loving and kind to you that, hey, hey, don't despair, my child. I'll work it for good. I have to clean up your mess all the time. You always mess up, man. But I'll clean you up. I'll clean up the mess after you. I mean, how loving, how kind. Doesn't that keep you encouraged? Keep you serving the Lord? But no, uh, we don't. That's why you're dying. You don't look at his loving kindness. You just look at all the negative things in your life. Now, if I look at this small finger, okay? His finger's small, right? If I look at this whole room, it should be bigger. It should be easier to see from my eyes, this whole room like this. But it's amazing. I can miss out this whole room by just looking at this one little finger. If I put all my focus on this little finger, I'm going to miss out anything in this wall here. The, the missionary letters there, the map, the chart, exit door sign, you know, light bulbs, uh, the people here. I can miss all of that. I can be blind to those things because all I'm seeing is this little finger. Why? Because I'm putting all my focus on that. You know, the problem is, is that uh, a lot of you, God has... God can fill up this room with gold, silver, physical blessings, spiritual blessings, salvation through his son, grace through faith, his gift, the brethren, and shower you with blessings. But it's amazing you can miss out a whole room full of that when you look at this problem right here. No matter how, no matter how small it is, you can still miss out the entire blessing of God if you put all your focus on this little finger of a problem. And you got to realize when you look at eternity, eternity is bigger than this. This is your problem compared to eternity, you know that? No matter how great, how big your problem is, it still pales in comparison to all that God has done for you. But the problem looks very big to you, doesn't it? This finger looks very big to you. Why? Because you're putting all your focus on it. It looks real to you. I concentrate more things on this finger than everything else in this room. Why? Because all my focus is on this little finger. No matter how small it is, it can look very big to me. Right. It's filling up all my vision, all my capacity right now. Why? Because my focus, I'm focusing. I'm focusing on this little finger. That's how you miss out the loving kindness of God. His loving kindness is deeper than any ocean, fills up everything, expands throughout the universe. You can miss out all that because this. This, your focus is on this. Stop focusing. Stop putting all your focus on this. My last point, seventh point, live by the Savior. Live by the Savior. 1 Peter 3.18 shows that we can receive life. We can be quickened because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Man, praise the Lord that Jesus Christ is the one that can make us alive. No matter, no matter how many times the devil tried to kill him, you know what? He just can't die. He always brings life. Herod tried to wipe out all the babies in the city. He did a merciless slaughter. 
wiped out every single infant in there. And the devil said, I'm going to be thorough. I'm going to make sure that Jesus died. But Jesus got out. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus got out and he escaped. He and Jesus said to the devil, no, I cannot die. Amen. And then the devil, he brings him out 40 days in the wilderness, tempting him and trying to kill Jesus over there. And the devil said, using scripture, hey, uh, Jesus, why don't you jump off of the temple? Commit suicide. Just jump off the temple. Commit suicide because the angels are actually going to rescue you. But thank God Jesus Christ didn't jump off the temple or commit suicide. He didn't die that day. Instead, Jesus looked at the devil and said, No, I cannot die. You can't kill me, can you? No matter how hard you try, I just can't die. Here are the Jews driven mad by the devil. The devil possesses these Jews with angers and they drive out Jesus from the synagogue because his preaching offended them and they're about to toss him out of the cliff. But Jesus Christ just happened to pass through the crowds without them touching him and get away and annoy them for three and a half years of ministering and preaching. And Jesus said to the devil, No, I cannot die. And then they brought him through the whipping post. And the devil poured out his terror. The, the devil poured out all of his power to make sure Jesus would quit. And as the whip came down his back and tore his flesh to shreds, muscles sliced open, veins popped out, he could have died from the whipping. And the devil said, you can stop here. You've done enough. Haven't you shed enough blood to wash away sin? You can die here. And Jesus Christ said, no, I ain't going to quit. I've got much more work to do. I just can't die. And then the devil, he put the crown of thorns on Jesus' head. The Roman soldiers and the Jews, they punched his face. They plucked off his beard. He could have died any moment from the beating after the whipping. But Jesus Christ looked at the devil and the devil said, Why don't you die? Just die. And Jesus said, No, I cannot die. They put a pound, they put so many pounds of a heavy cross on Jesus' back. Here his body is broken, bleeding, and dying. And he carries that heavy cross up the hill of Golgotha. He could have just died from suffocation, dehydration, blood spilling so much that he could have dropped dead any moment. And the devil said, You can stop right here. You can end it here. But Jesus says, No, I just can't die. I need to keep going. And as those spikes came down his hands and on his feet, and he, sh and he could feel the pain, his nerves spiked, back beating on the cross, the crunch of the bones as he heard it, the devil said, die, just die. And Jesus said, no, I cannot die. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ when he was hanging on the old rugged cross for hours and hours, he cried out, it is finished. Yes. And the devil said, finally, you die. But Jesus said three days later, no, I cannot die and kick the tomb open. <laughs> praise the Lord. Two, yes. Praise the Lord. 2,000 years later, the living Savior is not dead. And he lives inside your heart. And the devil has mercilessly tormented your life with hardship, with pain, health broken, family torn apart, the world turning against you. The devil won't give you a break. Problems going on amongst family and even Christian brethren. Life in turmoil, your mind splitting in half, heart heavy with grief, and you feel like throwing up weeping till you can no longer cry. You feel like dying. You feel like dying. And all you can hear from your depressed mind, from your worried heart, which is the devil talking to you, die. Just die. But Jesus Christ comes out from your heart and says, no, I cannot die. Strange. Strange. Out of all the bunches in, the wor in, in our history, Christians have been pushed around. Bible-believing Christians have been pushed around, killed, tortured. And they just won't die. 
here we are, 2023, merciless beating and killing. And the outward man feels like perishing and dying. But the inward man screams out from you, I just can't die. You feel, like, you feel like dying. I know, right? You feel like dying. You know, Psalm 119 is the passage that mentioned quicken the most. The longest chapter in the Bible would mention quicken the most. Why would the psalmist do that? I think he's trying to point out no matter how long it goes, he wants to live. No matter how long, listen, no matter how long the hard road is, how long that mountain climb is, how long that storm just rages and it just won't shut up, and the devil won't give you a break, no matter how long it is, it's so strange, isn't it? Even though you feel like dying, something inside you says, I just can't die. I just can't. You ever wondered why? You ever wonder why you're still living now? Some of you felt like dying yesterday. Maybe a couple of weeks ago, I don't know. But isn't it strange? You, you're still alive. You're here. Because something inside says, I don't want to die. I don't. That's Jesus. That's Jesus in you. I think no matter how much your flesh is crying out in pain and it feels like dying, there's something deep inside your heart that's saying, no, I want to live. I don't want to die. Well, that's Jesus speaking to you. Why don't you just let him speak to you? Let him continue working to you, clinging on to dear life, living through every dying, painful, near-death experiences, the onslaught, the chaos. Let Jesus continue to say in you, let him keep working in you, I don't want to die. Will you allow him? Will you allow him? Every head bow and every eye shut.